morning, everyone. So nice to see you at a great crowd. You know, I have to say, when I saw this rain, I thought nobody would come. So I brought my own cheering section, my entire family right here. <laughs> um, I'm wondering how many Return Teacher volunteers there are here in this audience. If you're a Return Teacher volunteer, stand up if you can or raise your hand. Look at this. I just want to say that one of my favorite Return Peace Corps volunteers is Tim Carroll, and in my honor, he wore the exact same outfit. <laughs> How about, are there people who have family members who either have served in the Peace Corps or are in the Peace Corps? If you have a family member who served in the Peace Corps, please stand up. You know, what I always say is that um, it's a sacrifice for a family to have a family member to have a, a family member in the Peace Corps because they go away to a very far place and you miss them a lot and you're worried about their safety and security and, and it is a sacrifice. So I am deeply grateful to all of you who supported Peace Corps volunteers. And let me ask you now, I know we have a lot of students here, are there any people who aspire to be a Peace Corps volunteer or at least are interested in looking at it? Stand up, stand up. Yeah, that's great. Well, this is terrific. What a great audience. Um, I also want to thank my good friend, Kathy Blumen, who is sponsoring this event. So, Bloomer and Kathy have also been very gracious to have us here. So much fun to spend the, the lunch time with you. So, I suspect that we are all here today because we care about the state of the world and we share a global outlook, a belief that in this complex, dynamic, rapidly changing environment, that we need to have engagement with other countries, that we share a common planet, and that we sense that our global community has to work together in order to create a better world. We care about the fate of a young woman in Tanzania or a young boy in Micronesia, not just because we believe they have intrinsic value, but because they may hold the keys to our future development. As you just heard from my introduction, I'm the head of an organization called PCI, Project Concern International. And we are driven by the belief that intellect, talent, and motivation are equally distributed around the world, but opportunity is not. We believe that each person everywhere holds deep within themselves the possibility of doing great things in service to humanity. Conflict, poverty, harmful gender norms, inequality hold people back from achieving their full potential. There is surely right now a girl in Africa with the intellectual capacity to be the next Bill Gates if only given the opportunity. Somewhere in Latin America, there is a young boy capable of leading with the compassion and humility of Nelson Mandela, if only given the opportunity to develop his potential. And right here in northern Michigan, there is a child capable of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's commitment to justice and equality, if only given the opportunity to thrive intellectually. At PCI, we believe the most important thing we can do is help connect people, no matter who they are. Do I need to put this in the middle? Okay, you can't hear me. Is that better? Okay. I'll try to turn my whole body. <laughs> um, we believe that the most important thing we can do, no, maybe I should use, um, where's the handheld mic? Is this okay? Handheld better? Okay, let me turn this one off. I do like to wander around, so maybe that's better. Let me turn this off here. All right. We believe that the most important thing we can do is lift the capacity of all people, that we you know, we really believe intentionally 
that the best thing we can do is empower communities to lift themselves out of poverty. We believe that all people, oh, really have to hold it close. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We believe that the most important thing we can do is equip people with the skills, tools, and resources that will enable them to lift themselves out of poverty and to define their own path forward. Because the world's greatest challenges are, must be solved together. We share one planet Earth and one atmosphere, and, and we believe that our chances of living successfully into the future will be higher if we can draw on the talents and the intellect of all people. And that's what we're devoted to. And that's something that I learned in the Peace Corps. So I've been coming to Northern Michigan for all my life. And since 1974, my family has lived here. And I am so delighted that my family is here, my awesome family is here, including my father, who's 87 years young. And I just want to say publicly how very grateful I am to my family because they have given me a worldview. They gave me the opportunity as a young person to to see the world, and they have also helped me, taught me really, to find joy in serving others. And my family is my guiding light, and I owe everything to them, so I am so very proud to be with, with them, and I'm so happy they're here tonight. As you heard from Stan, I did go away from college, and in fact, I have lived elsewhere for most of my adult life, but I have a home in Frankfurt, and I get back here every single moment I can. And this is my true north. I call this my true north, and it is my true north, and I love it here. But I have worked in the area of international development and humanitarian assistance for all of my adult life. And as you heard from Stan, it all started as a Peace Corps volunteer in Samoa, where I served with my husband, Steve, who is a fellow Michigander. He's from East Lansing. Does this work for all of you? I feel like it's heck okay. All right. Um, I later, as you heard from Stan also, had the good fortune of being appointed by President Obama to be the director of the Peace Corps. And I'm going to share with you tonight a bunch of Peace Corps stories, okay, because that, that is my world, and there are some really amazing Peace Corps stories. But I really want to be clear and upfront right now that you don't have to be a volunteer to engage for good in the world. You do not have to travel overseas. Every single one of us is capable of doing great things right here where we are with what we have. Every single one of us can make a difference in the world if we live with intentionality and purpose. And that is really the main theme of my talk tonight. I want to illustrate this with a story. President John F. Kennedy, in one of the early days of his administration, went to visit NASA. He went to the control tower. He visited with some of the astronauts got to meet all the folks, uh, the administrator and all the high-level folks in NASA. And when he was done with his visit, he came down the elevator. It was the end of the day. And when he exited the elevator, he saw a janitor. And he was a really kind man, JFK. So he walked right over to the janitor, and he stuck out his hand, and he said, Hi, I am Doc I'm Jack Kennedy. Can you tell me about yourself? And the man did not meet a beat. Uh, miss a beat. He, he shook his hand out. He, he, stood, he uh, extended his hand and he said, my name is Frank and I'm helping to put a man on the moon. So Frank made the very clear connection between the work that he was doing as a janitor and the extraordinary work of putting a man on the moon. You can be anywhere. You can do anything if you do it with intentionality and purpose. So remember that story. It's a great story. In the words of Martin Luther King, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your noun and your verb agree. All you need is a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. So if you don't remember anything else about tonight, that is what I want you to remember. I want to start, though, talking about the world that we inhabit today. Frankly, it is really easy to be cynical. When we look at the newspaper, all we see is news of destruction and hatred and division. We see a deadly civil war in Syria. We hear about school shootings across the country. We hear about a divisive political environment. We hear about evidence of growing climate change, stories of economic hardship and people at the end of their rope. 
But the truth of the matter is, never before in the history of the world have we witnessed the, ma the progress of the magnitude that we have seen in the last 25 years in elevating humanity, in addressing poverty, in improving health, in increasing incomes, and in reducing conflict. Never before in the history of the world. You may be surprised by that story, by that statement. And if you are, you are not alone. Most Americans believe that the world is a far worse place now than it was before. But in fact, the opposite is true. For example, in the, in the decades since the end of the Cold War, nearly one billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. One billion. That is not only astonishing, but it is unprecedented in human history. In fact, we've made more progress in reducing extreme poverty in the last 25 years than in the past 500 years combined. When I joined the Peace Corps 38 years ago, nearly 70 out of every 1,000 children died because of malnutrition or related illness by the time they were five. And that number now has been cut in half. Today, 18.2 million people living with HIV have access to life-saving antiretroviral drugs, thanks to the President's Emergency Plans for AIDS Relief, which is our country's HIV program. Over the past 15 years, our malaria programs have cut malaria by 37% globally and by 42% in Africa. And the good news continues, the number of college graduates globally is four times higher today than it was in 1970 for men and 70 times higher for women. And with the exception of Cuba, every country in our hemisphere has become a democracy. Now, many of them are flawed, that is for sure. But for citizens in our hemisphere, they now have the right to choose their leaders at the ballot box and not at the point of a gun. And even though reports of violent conflict abide in the news, they dominate everywhere, it seems like it's the only thing we're reporting on, the world in general has become a more peaceful place, whether measured by the number of wars, scale of conflict, or the numbers of, of lives lost to acts of violence. Now that is not to take away from the fact that there's still a lot of violence and division, and there is also growing economic um, disparity in our own country. So things aren't, it, it doesn't mean that everything is perfect, but I think it's really important to take a fresh look at the incredible progress that has been made by humanity in the last 25 years and consider how we can continue to build upon that to create a better world in the future. It's really important to recognize how much progress has been made. We need to shine a light on this incredible progress and also realize that so much of that is due to the support of our country. Our tax dollars at work have been the largest contributing factor to that extraordinary change in the world. And our American global leadership is incredibly important. It could not be more important now than ever before. So that's another key message that I want to leave with you. And the reason I say that is because in this increasingly complex and interconnected world, we're going to need to be able to relate with people from other countries more, not less. It means we're going to have to have greater understanding and cooperation between people of different nations, different ethnic groups, different economic classes, and different beliefs, different political beliefs, internationally, also here at home. And it's going to be painful at times, but we have to learn to get together. So as we explore the theme of engaging for good, I want to leave you with three challenges. And these are challenges that I thought a lot about over the last couple of years, because I speak to a lot of young people in particular. And so there are three things that I want to talk to you about today. And the first challenge that I want to leave to you, I want to leave with you is choose optimism. Winston Churchill once said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So if we're going to make a difference in our world or in our community, we need to look with optimism at the opportunities before us. Every single day, every day, I meet someone whose life is a testimony to the power of a brighter tomorrow. I, I meet some extraordinary people in my, my uh, job. And I want to start by telling you about Peter Turk. Peter Turr is a young man. He was born in South Sudan. When he was about three years old, he's not quite sure how old he was, three or four, 
his family, his village was attacked by Sudanese marauders. They were Muslim. They happened to have been Muslim, although they certainly weren't following Muslim teachings. They were criminals, and they burned his village, raped the women, and his family was scattered. And Peter ran into the woods, and he wandered between Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Kenya for a decade or more. He was one of the lost boys. Eventually, he made his way to a refugee camp in Kenya, where he learned to read for the first time, thanks to the United Nations, an organization that our country supports quite substantially. And he was a very bright student and a great reader. And eventually, after about a decade in the refugee camp, was allowed to come to the United States as a refugee, and he settled in Florida. He really had a thirst for education, even though he had never been to a day of school in his life. And he studied very hard to um, pass the GED, which he did. And then he won a full scholarship to the University of Florida. He graduated in three years at the top of his class. And he decided that he wanted to be a Peace Corps volunteer to serve the country that he felt had given him so much, the United States. When Peter applied to the Peace Corps, he only had one request. He said, please send me to a Muslim country, because he did not want to live his life fearing the people who shared a faith, the Islamic faith, with the people who had murdered his family. And he knew that he would never be able to get over his fear unless he learned to love Muslims. In his words, the only way he knew to seek reconciliation and learn to love Muslims was to live among them. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Peace Corps right now. I assume many of you know about Peace Corps, but I just want to, for those of you who don't, I want to just tell you a few things about Peace Corps. Peace Corps is a program, an American program. It's a federal agency. Volunteers go and live and work overseas for two years, and they learn about the language, they learn about the culture, and they're there to do a job. They're health workers, or they're teachers, or they're youth workers. And they are trained to do that work. But they do mo much, much more than that, because what they do is they become part of the community. They live in the same homes as, as their community members. They eat the same food. They travel on public buses. And over time, they develop incredible relationships of trust. And once they build the trust, and earn the trust of their community and begin to see the world through their eyes, that is when they begin to become effective. And so Peter, that's what Peter did. He was sent to Azerbaijan, which is a Muslim-majority country in Central Asia, where there was incredible suspicions of Americans. So now Peter has become an American, and they had never before seen a person of color. But an Azeri family welcomed him into their home and he became like a son to them. And it was there, that was the beginning of Peter's long retreat from the fear and hatred that he had lived with since he was three. Because that family embraced him with so much love that he was able to fully embrace love for his Muslim brothers and sisters. In Peter's words, what surprised me most was how human love and connection were stronger than my tragic family history, my religion, my nationality, and the color of my skin. Peter worked as a teacher in a school where the average girl dropped out when she was 14 years old so she could be married. That was the way it had always been, he was told. This is what our religion calls us to do, he was told. Yet the more Peter delved into the Azari culture, the more he studied the Quran, because he did do that, the more he talked to people, the more he studied at the feet of the imam, he learned that, that in fact, this wasn't consistent with much of the Islamic teachings. And this, the girls, every day he'd go to school and the girls would say, oh, please, Peter, help us. We want to stay in school. Can you please help us? Talk to our families. So he did. He did go and, and visit the families, and he, he talked to the local religious leaders. And when he went there, he didn't try to persuade them using you know, American arguments. Instead, he went humbly with the words of the Quran 
and, and he, he listened and talked, and eventually the religious leaders who had opposed girls staying in school beyond the age of 14 eventually became the strongest advocates for girls' education. By the time Peter Lee left, and Peter stayed there for three years, the parity, the age parity between boys and girls was almost equal, and it was the only school outside the capital of Baku that had that kind of age, uh, gender parity, sorry, gender parity between boys and girls. And so that was remarkable. But the way he did it was sitting in humility and respect and talking to the family. Peter saw himself not so much as a leader, but as a student, and that was his approach. This is what he says about the experience. The best way to learn about the world and to make a difference is by being fearless for the sake of doing good in the world. His is a remarkable story of reconciliation and love and the courage it takes to find forgiveness and forge common ground. When faced with his devastating loss, Peter could have chosen anger, hatred, bitterness, and fear, but instead he chose purpose, activism, and optimism. By choosing optimism instead of despair, Peter turned his personal tragedy into a call for service to others, giving the girls of his school the opportunity for education and to discover their potential and the ability to dream big dreams. He overcame that incredible fear so that others could have a brighter future. He is such an incredible example for all of us. Like Peter, I urge all of us to pursue the kind of defiant optimism that sees the world as it is in all of its warts, with all of its warts and all of its perils, but also see it for all its power and potential and see what it can become as we work together. So the first challenge, choose optimism. Second challenge, make relationships your priority. Whether we're talking about family or business or diplomacy, relations are Relationships are the most important things. The most important moments in life are defined by relationships. A wise woman once told me, if you're in, in an argument with someone, walk a mile in their shoes. And then if you still can't agree, you're a mile away and you have their shoes. <laughs> but you know, the truth of the matter is being able to walk a mile in someone's shoes to see the world from their eyes, to be able to empathize with their perspective. Those are the skills that are most important now in navigating this increasingly complex and interconnected world. I want to tell you a story, a very powerful story, that I heard from General Carl Eikenberry, who was an army general, but then later became the ambassador to Afghanistan. He told me about a terrible, bloody battle in Helmand province, which is a battle to win, over, win control over a particular piece of land that was very strategic. Like most of the districts, most of the districts in that part of Afghanistan were controlled by the Taliban, but this particular area was not. It had thrown its fate in with the Americans and with the Afghan government. And it was really actively fighting against the Taliban. So the Americans came in. The joint American-Afghani force came in. It was a terrible battle. And 15 Marines died that day. But in the end, the U.S.-Afghani forces were successful, and they were able to recover that land. Ambassador Eikenberry decided to go, go to that area so he could meet with the local chieftains and begin to establish a stronghold there. And so he arrived with his convoy, and he probably had, you know, was in a bulletproof vehicle and had 20 other vehicles with him. And when he arrived, he pulled into this village that was the district capital, and a man emerged from the, from the hut and was so excited. He was running towards the car. He was shaking his hands, and he was clearly so, so excited. And General Eikenberry was thinking, oh, he's probably, you know, coming out saying thank you, and it was obvious he was so happy to see him. And so he asked the translator, please tell me what this man is saying. And the translator said, he's looking for someone named Rick. <laughs> and General Eikenberry said, Rick? Is there 
there's someone named Rick in my entourage that I don't know about? No, there's nobody named Rick. So the translator asked Danielle what he was talking about. He said, Rick, Rick. Rick was a Peace Corps volunteer. And Rick had served there 40 years earlier. He said Rick was like a brother to him. He lived in my home. He was a teacher at my school. I, he taught me English, but it was so much more. We spent every day together, and he was like a brother to me. And when I heard the Americans was coming, the Americans were coming, I was hoping that Rick was among them. Now, General Eikenberry told me that he went home that night and he could not sleep. And he said, I can sleep anywhere. I learned to sleep in a foxhole. I can sleep anywhere. But that night I could not sleep. And he said, I finally figured out why I couldn't sleep. And this is why. Those 15 Marines who had died that day in giving their lives for that village, their names would never be known. But that one Peace Corps volunteer who had served there 40 years earlier was still beloved by that village. He said, that's when I began to understand the transformational power of the Peace Corps. The relationship of friendship and trust between that Afghani leader and that Peace Corps volunteer transcended time, geography, and political space. People of that village threw their lot in with the Americans and looked to the U.S. in friendship, both because the Americans had saved them, but also because of the love and friendship that they had received from that volunteer so long ago. Ambassador Eikenberry has now become one of our fiercest, most supportive um, communicators. He speaks all the time about the importance of the U.S. and American um, U.S. engagement with the world, and, and the need to use all of the tools in our diplomatic toolbox. So that includes the military, includes our diplomacy, our State Department, and includes our Peace Corps volunteers and our aid workers. General Mattis, the former Jim Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, said this. I was at an event last night at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, a big event. There were 1,000 people. And this is what General Mattis said. He said, there are two kinds of power that the United States has the power to intimidate, and the power to inspire. We, knew we need both to preserve the world. But the power of inspiration is the strongest power we have. Make relationships your priority. My last challenge, be the change you seek in the world. Change happens so slowly. One of the reasons why Peace Corps volunteers are so very effective is because they simply sit, live, be with their community. They don't go in there wanting to make change. I mean, they do want to make change often, but they, they do it in a way where they build relationships first. The strong relationships that volunteers have with their community members are really the basis of their effectiveness. And I want to share another story with you. And this is a story about Vic and Adrian in Malawi. Now, I met Vic just before I left the Peace Corps in, in 2017, and he and his wife had just returned, it was, it was like a week before. And I, I said, so Vic, tell me, do you think you made a, a difference during your time in Malawi? And he said, you know, if you would have asked me that question a month ago, I would have given you a very different answer. I would have told you how proud I was that my students, he was a math teacher, um, performed so well on their national exam. My students were, had an average that was 25% higher than the national average. That would have made me really proud. But he said, something happened on the last day that absolutely blew me away. And so I said, well, tell me about it. And this is what he said. He said, my wife, Adrian and I um, lived in a small village in central Malawi. And we lived in a you know, thatched roof hut, just like everybody else. Adrian worked at a local health clinic. I was the math teacher at the school. And we had a modern American marriage. So that meant that I helped her with chores that were considered feminine. So I went shopping with her at the market, and I helped cook, and I even helped wash the clothes by hand. And she helped me do some of the tasks that are considered men's tasks. For example, our thatched roof hut had a hole in it, and Adrian went up on the roof because I was afraid if I went up, I would fall through. She also fixed the fence. 
And we used to bike all around. We had a great time. We would go and visit families together. And and we just loved our time in, in uh, Malawi. And we became close with members of our community. So on the day we were packing up, we got a knock on the door. And it was one of my students. And it was actually one of the students that was shy. And I was kind of surprised to see him. When I opened the door, I sort of thought, oh, he's going to congratulate me for being such an excellent teacher. <laughs> but this is what he said. This is what that boy said to him. He said, Mr. Vick, I heard you were leaving, and I wanted to tell you this. When I grow up, I'm going to treat my wife like you treat yours. He said, I have seen the way that you work together, how you share domestic chores, how you have so much love, how you listen to her and ask her opinion, and how she asks you for your opinion, too. People in my village don't relate like that. But when I grow up, that is how I'm going to be for you. Now, I don't know if he was any good in math at all. I don't know if he can measure the diameter of a circle. But I imagine that his future wife is going to be really happy that Vic was his teacher. But see, that would never have happened if Vic hadn't lived there for two years among them. And that is the color of his heart. So all of you are here today because you believe in the importance of working across boundaries to create a better, more equitable world. And if you're drawn to a lecture on the topic of how one person can make a difference, then I suspect that you are people who passionately believe in the power of service to change lives. Those who serve, either because it's their job or because they are drawn to helping others in their everyday life, they do it because it makes them feel good, because they get a lot out of it, and because their lives are changed and enriched by the people that they meet through their service experience, as well as wanting to help others and create a better world. Today, I have shared stories of volunteers who are living around the world and whose acts of service have really made a difference in other people's lives. But now I want to bring that home to northern Michigan. The point I really want to leave you with is this, and this is the point I made earlier. You do not have to go halfway around the world to make a difference. Each of us has a gift to give others right here, right now, with what we are. My 99-year-old grandma, Grandma Ruth, used to make hangers. She crocheted hangers. And she said to me, I only want to be useful. That's what I want to do. And so she made these beautiful hangers. And I tell you, when I open my coat closet every single day, there are hangers from Grandma Ruth. She wanted to be of service, and she lived a life of service. And she is one of the people that really made me want to devote my life to service. So every single one of us has a gift to share with the world. So here is the bonus challenge. Can we take our commitment and our interest, our appetite for working across national boundaries to reaching out to other cultures to learning about people who are different from us in other lands and apply that to people living right here in our country? Can we develop empathy and love for people in our own country who are different from us? At a time when our nation's focus is fixed so much on the things that divide us, can we talk about creating bonds of friendship across political lines, across economic lines, across racial lines here in our country? Can we think about sharing a meal, extending a help, uh, helping hand, creating a bond of friendship with someone who thinks radically different from us? We have seen the cost of division in our country very clearly in the last couple of months. Division isn't just about the rhetoric that lights up the airwaves, or it's not just about the headlines. It's about the fear that hardens into walls between people. It's about the anger that radicalizes. It's about the hatred that rips apart seams of society. Tonight, as we gather at a time of tremendous change and opportunity for our nation and our world, 
I challenge us to open our hearts and our minds to our own countrymen and women who think differently from us. Can we honor the differences between our own people and refuse to abide by bigotry, hatred, or intolerance of any kind? As we work to promote peace and justice overseas, can we also commit to doing the same thing right here? Can we find a way to step into one, o- one another's shoes and truly listen to each other? Be inquisitive about why someone has a totally different perspective from us, even if they voted for a different candidate? In the words of Gandhi, can we be the change we want to see in the world? There's a choice when all we see around us is rancor and division, when all we see is borders and divide. Because what I have seen over the course of my time in the Peace Corps and in my, wor- in, in my work in international development is this, that finding common ground with another person who thinks very differently from you is a choice. We can choose whether or not we're going to extend a listening ear to someone who thinks really differently from us. Even when we don't see eye to eye someone, we can stand beside them heart to heart and truly attempt to understand them and their perspective. Because it's really interesting. I've done, there have been a lot of talks about what are the things that, what are the prejudices or the biases that tear our country apart? And it's more often around political parties and party affiliation than anything else. So can we reach across those lines and really, truly, and honestly seek to understand each other? That's what my hope is for this country. Because we are not going to be able to function as a global leader if we can't ourselves be united. We can choose to build bridges. We can choose to to believe optimistically in the future. We can choose to build relationships across divides and all kinds. So that is my challenge for you all tonight. Thank you. You want to do Q&A? I, I think we have time for some Q&A. Probably a fair amount of time. Um, are there any questions? We have microphones around the room. There. Okay. Maybe I could start with a question right up here. And that is, we were both in the Peace Corps a while ago. I was in 71, you were in, starting in 80, 81. How has it changed since that time? Thanks a lot. Yeah, Peace Corps changed a lot. I would say probably the biggest change is technology. I mean, it used to be that you, you were talking about how you could get on a bus and go anywhere and no one would know where you were. Well, that's not the case now. Peace Corps is pretty connected with everybody at all moments. And every single volunteer has a cell phone, which also means that they can call home and you know, talk to their mother or their girlfriend. Um, so technology is probably the biggest change. It also is true that we use, that volunteers use technology to do good development work. So volunteers use um, technology to create uh, programs. Um, for example, there are some volunteers in Botswana. It was an HIV-AIDS program, but it was a program to um, allow volunteers. It was a cell-based application form that allowed uh, young people to ask questions that they couldn't talk about in their family or in their community. So questions about sexually transmitted infections or questions about HIV or questions about gender orientation or sexual orientation or anything, really, any question they had that they didn't feel that they could ask openly in their community. And Peace Corps volunteers trained young Botswana um, students to be able to answer these text messages and then they, they connected them to services. So that's just one example of how technology is um, being used by volunteers to further develop. So that's probably one of the biggest changes. Yeah. Safety and security is a huge issue too. It, you know, there's so there wasn't even a, a safety and security advisor on staff of Peace Corps until after um, 9-11. So that 9-11 changed everything. Questions? Yeah. 
Would you talk a little bit about the work your current uh, organization does? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Yeah, PCI. So we're in 16 countries around the world. Um, we Our work is in, our, our mission is to enhance health, end hunger, overcome hardship, and advance women and girls. So that means that we do health programming. We do agriculture and food security programs. We um, respond to humanitarian crises, mostly natural disasters. And in everything we do, we have a gender lens, which doesn't mean that we just work with girls and women. It means that we look at the gender dynamics within every community, and then we use those to help us design better programs that will most, most effectively lift the lives of those community members. We, um, I, I told you a little bit about our philosophy earlier. We really believe strongly that each individual is capable of doing great things if only given the opportunity. So we employ sort of a human-centered design approach to um, bring communities together so that they can identify their own greatest challenges and then define their own solutions. So, um, and then based on that, we help connect them to the resources, the tools, the training, and, and financial resources that they need to be able to lead themselves out of poverty. Our funding comes from the U.S. government, but also from foundations and private individuals. And um, yeah, our, our work is very similar. I was drawn to PCI because its approach is very similar to the approach that I found to be very effective in Peace Corps, which is really about building capacity of, of um, communities. It's more sustainable. No, no, they're not. They're mostly not Americans. About a thousand people. We have about a thousand employees, and eight hundred of them are host country nationals. Yeah, so they're members of their own country. And we're doing some cool things with technology. I can tell you about one of them. I don't know if there are any other questions, but one of the things that because we're we're based in California, actually, I live in Washington D.C., but my organization is headquartered in San Diego, and. Um, because it's a California organization, we do a lot of work with technology. And one of the things we've developed is a smartphone app that allows pastoralist herders, so people who herd cows and goats, to be able to find the fastest path to green pasture land and water. Because the um, because of climate change, their traditional grazing practices, the places that they've gone for millennia, are now gone. They go to the places they used to go, and there's nothing there but desert. And so this app is like Waze for, um, for, for, for farmers, for pastoralists, for shepherds. And it has cut um, herd mortality. We, we've been doing it for three years, and it has cut herd mortality in half. But it has had some really important, um, unexpected positive benefits. And one of them is that th there has been a lot of tension between traditional herding families and the conservationists who have the parks and also farmers, commercial farmers. Nobody wants the animals to walk over their land. And so what this app does is it shows them where the boundaries are so they can avoid the boundaries. In Nigeria, I, I learned an astounding fact the other day. In Nigeria, more people died because of conflict between the herders and the farmers, then they died at the hands of Boko Haram. Hundreds and hundreds of people are dying because of conflict between the herders and the farmers. So this, this app allows them to stick to the places that are safe for them to go. The other benefit is that they used to have to send kids out. They, they send their children out to find the green pasture land and water, and now that they know exactly where to go, the kids are in school. And so school enrollment rates have just tripled. So there, so that's a particularly cool technology that I really like. I don't have a question so much. My name is Sue Bauer, and I'm the volunteer coordinator of the Father Fred Foundation here in town. And I see a lot of current and past volunteers here. But we have 280 active volunteers in our community just giving things away. And I just think that our community doesn't, isn't really aware that there are like 65 nonprofits that depend on volunteers to do everything from maritime sailing to 
blessings in a backpack to trails and we just live in such an amazing community and I really appreciated hearing from you because I think my volunteers sometimes think well I'm not doing enough I'm not changing the world but what you've just really reinforced is it's the relationship that we have with our neighbors that is most impactful. So thank Absolutely. you very much. I mean, honestly, if you can if you can have one relationship with Trust and really, really have a deep relationship and help someone in that way, that's so important. And you know, I think often we don't know what the opportunities are. I don't know if there are ways of promoting the different volunteer opportunities, but I know that people. I, I often I, I'm in Washington D.C. There's a lot of people, a lot of opportunities to volunteer. I don't know what they are. So I think just knowing about opportunities is important. How many of you volunteer? See, what an, aud what an amazing and awesome audience. You probably could tell about 100 great stories. You should be up here instead of me. Any other questions? Carrie, it's wonderful to hear you oh, yeah. speak tonight. It's exciting. I'm wondering, does the Peace Corps work in any of our cities here in our country, I mean, here in Michigan, in Detroit, anywhere? There aren't Peace Corps volunteers here, but there are AmeriCorps volunteers. And AmeriCorps is very much like Peace Corps. Actually, there are two programs. There's AmeriCorps, and then there's VISTA. And VISTA is actually just like Peace Corps, but it's domestic. And the reason, the, the difference between the two is that VISTA volunteers live in inner cities, or they live in very remote areas. And they work with the most vulnerable communities to do the same kind of community development work that Peace Corps volunteers do. AmeriCorps volunteers are also awesome. Are there any AmeriCorps volunteers here? Well, they're awesome. And 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 you know what this they, they are also funded by the US government. And what they do is they mostly work in nonprofits. They work in the organizations that support all of us. And the U.S. government pays a portion of their salary, and then the nonprofit pays the other portion. So they pay, I think, about fifteen thousand dollars, and then the nonprofit would pay the, the balance. But they are helping all these extraordinary nonprofits that are in our country to be successful by providing these really extraordinary, mostly young people. So we don't have domestic peace. Well, we have Vista, which is domestic peace corps, and then we have AmeriCorps. And there are many more of them. Every year in Peace Corps, there are anywhere between seven and 10,000. Every year in our country, there are, are more than 80,000 AmeriCorps volunteers. So it's a fabulous program of our federal government. Hi, um, I don't really have a question, per se. Um, but my name is Ashley, and I served in Madagascar from Ooh. 2015 to 2017. Uh, and I actually had the opportunity to meet you when you came and visited my site. Um, and I just wanted to share the letter that you wrote to me because it meant so much coming at a time about a year into my service when you start, sorry, uh, about a year into my service when you start questioning like what, what am I doing here and that and you came and you wrote me this wonderful letter so I just wanted to share it. Um, it says, Dear Ashley, thank you for showing us your beautiful site. I was impressed by all the work you are doing and enjoyed witnessing the strong relationships you have developed within your community. You are make a making a difference in the lives of so many. It is a great honor for me to lead an agency that has dedicated and gifted volunteers like you representing our country in Madagascar and 59 other countries around the world. I often write to families of volunteers I visit in their communities of, of countries of service to tell them about my trip. If you send me the names and email addresses of your family and friends, I will write to them. Thank you for your insight, kind words, and service in Madagascar. I wish you the very best throughout the rest of your service. Thank you for your incredible, I remember that time, and it was so wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing. I did share that letter, and I wrote to your family, didn't I? <laughs> it was one of the best things I did, really. I wrote to family members all over the country. I love that. Thank you, Ashley, for your service. I was wondering if you could share with us some of the dangers that the uh, uh, Peace Corps volunteers face, and what are we doing to uh, ensure their safety? Yeah, it's the most important thing we do, to be honest with you. And if, if people used to ask me, what keeps you up at night? It's the safety and security of our volunteers. Um, the leading uh, threat 
to Peace Corps volunteers are motor vehicle accidents because they don't have the kind of automobile standards, especially for public transportation that we have in our country. So the leading cause of death was vehicular homicide or whatever you want to say. Um, but, you know, illness is always also a possibility. Um, you know, the, I, while I was in the Peace Corps, I was seven years in the Peace Corps. I was two years as deputy director. I was about a year and a half as acting director, and then the balance of the time was when I was director. And during that time, about 40,000 Peace Corps volunteers went through. Of that, we lost 16 volunteers which seems like a lot. And I can tell you, I called every single family, and it was the hardest thing I ever did, to call someone and tell them that their loved one had passed away. But the mortality rate is lower than if you were a young person living in an urban area in the United States, but they are exposed to different threats. So motor vehicles, we had a drowning a couple of people who died from um, illness, malaria, um, a couple of drug overdoses. Kind of, you know. We take, Peace Corps takes safety and security very, very seriously, and that was something we worked on hard during my time. Those of you who served under my administration know that we got really, um, a lot more rigorous about our training in safety and security, especially around sexual assault. That was a big issue, was sexual assault. It's a problem in the Peace Corps. It's a problem everywhere in the world. It's a problem here. And um, so we worked very closely with some of our nation's leading experts to improve the training and support that we provide to volunteers around the issue of sexual assault and harassment. It's one of the things I'm most proud of, actually, but it, it was a hard it was hard, and it was heartbreaking, some of the stories that we heard. I know this to be true because I was also sexually assaulted as a Peace Corps volunteer, something I had never disclosed until I was confronted by the painful stories of volunteers who came forward with the stories of their own sexual assault. And when they came forward to, to me and told me how unprepared Peace Corps was to deal with their own assaults, it made me realize, it made me want to tell my own personal story, which I had never shared. I had to tell my family that, that I had been sexually assaulted as a volunteer. I had never spoken about it before. But I could not lead the agency authentically if I didn't tell my own personal truth and then do every single thing I could to make it better for volunteers. So we made over 30 policy changes. We trained every single staff member once a year. We had specialized training for our first responders. We created a, um, a hotline that was um, hosted by an external group. It's called RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, so that if volunteers didn't feel comfortable reporting to a Peace Corps staff member, they could report to this independent organization. We created an Office of Victim Advocacy that supported not only victims of sexual assault, but victims of all kinds. So we did a lot of work to bring Peace Corps standards up to the modern age. Thank you for that question. Well, the safety issue is real. Our daughter is in Vanuatu in Peace Corps on oh. 22, and uh, she gives us a truck ride report. Um, there were 30 people rode in the pickup truck. Yeah, we're out of the jungle today. It's kind of frightening, huh? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, so she brought up one um, about a year into it. She got a bit discouraged about being, you know, how, how do we back in the States, you know, m maintain, uh, you know, what's the best way to encourage, you know, tell them what we're doing, you know, what, you know, what, what do you do um, to help them through those yeah, times of discouragement? Yeah, such a great question. You know, Vanuatu is, first of all, a beautiful, beautiful country, but some of the volunteers are very remote. Is she in a remote area? About an hour into the jungle, 16-hour boat ride north, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> Far away. The end of the earth, basically. Yeah, no, it's really so important to continue to encourage you. I mean, I think the most important thing you can do is just continue to um, remind her right. of why she did it and encourage her of your support no matter what she decides to do. 
Um, you know, some volunteers go home. Actually, that number is shrinking, but some volunteers do decide to do that, and that is okay. She serves. Um, but encouraging her uh, to remember those things that bring her such joy, some those small account accomplishments that make it worthwhile. I mean, when I was the Peace Corps director, it was a really hard job, and my husband, when I'd get down on any given day, he'd say to me, yeah, okay, you had a tough day. But, you know, are your volunteers doing extraordinary work in 60 countries around the world? Are they changing lives every day? And I'd say, yeah, and he said, okay, then stop feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> And so, you know, you. I'm sure she's told you about moments that were important to her. What's her job? Well, she's an environmental engineer, so she's there, you know, community health. She's helping them with uh, water supply. It's yeah, just, uh, such an important thing to do. So I'm sure she has shared some of those small victories. So w what I have found works for me, at least. I can only speak about my own experience. But uh, I think just reminding her of those small victories. And the truth of the matter is, is that once the Peace Corps service is really hard, it's really hard. But when you're done with it, you've got that for the rest of your life. Yeah, you and bet. I can, you can see these people here. I mean, it is something that binds you to other people for the rest of your life. My best friends in life now are the people I served with 38 years ago. And so reminding her of that, too, the reasons why she went in, those small victories, and, and the support system that she has in her fellow volunteers. I guess that's what I would say. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just curious because I remember you were talking about um, engaging with people who have different like, political views in their own own country, and I think that's very important. And I was thinking about, I guess, even my own family. We have some. Well, I think everybody kind of has some family. Yeah. Like that, but. <laughs> That's family, right? Um, I guess I was wondering, uh, what's the best way to engage with those family members in a way that's not like hostile? And how do you like <laughs> calm yourself? I guess. And, yeah. Like, it's a challenge, in, like, right? What they're, yeah. What they're you know, saying. I, I think we have to do it, though. Honestly, I just you know I I read the paper and I just think what we have to do is listen. That's really the most important thing. Not go in there trying to change anyone's mind, but just listen to them about why they believe, how they believe, and then sharing respectfully your perspective, too. I think if we go in with the goal to change someone right away, they're not going to receive it. They're going to put up a barrier. But if you, if, you, if you say, help me understand why this is important to you. You know, let me sh may I share my feelings as well? If, if we try to do it in a way that is respectful and thoughtful, you know, you may not change them, or maybe over time you will, but, and change takes a long time, but at least they will feel heard, and they'll feel validated, and they'll feel much more open to hearing your perspective if you listen first. So I guess that's the best advice I would give. And, you know, the other thing is, too, we don't always have to be having a debate. We could just be doing something together that builds relationships of trust because it's the, it's the trust that enables you to have deep conversations that eventually can change minds. It's one of, it's really, I mean, that's why I ended this on this note, which is probably a surprise to you. But I really feel that in our own country, we need to come together as a nation. There's nothing more important. You know, I was in North, I was speaking with some students the other day. I mean, just not earlier today. And I told them that about two weeks ago, I was in northern Tanzania, and I was um, with uh, the governor, what's the equivalent of a governor? It's called the regional commissioner of the Mara region, so it's up near the Serengeti. And this man, we were having dinner, he hosted me at his house, and he started telling me all about what he knew about the American political scene. He knew, the, he knew the profile and the position of every single one of the 22 Democratic candidates. It blew my mind away. He knew so much more than I did. He was so much more informed than I was. And he knew about President Trump's um, position on every topic. He knew all about the Ukraine issue. He knew everything. I said, how did you ever learn about all this? And he says, well, first of all, I'm glued to CNN. 
But then he said this. He said, look, the United States is incredibly important in my country. Your country slaps a tariff on cotton, and the prices drop dramatically in my country, and it means that my farmers are now destitute. What happens in your country has an incredible impact on my country. And the whole world, he said, you may not realize it. I think most Americans have no idea, but the whole world is watching what's happening in your country and also in the UK and other places, but especially in the United States. And, and they also see the division that's happening there. And we're concerned because we have looked to the United States for stability for so long. And it's unnerving to us that you are unstable right now. So basically, get your act together. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming out.